Hey, and welcome to the show. Uh, with the whole thing, uh, Jimmy Dore having a uh, having a uh, uh, Peter Schiff, I think his name is, um, on his show, complaining, bitching, you know, those between as far as money, cre- uh, money creation, and talk about how uh, inflation is money exp- expansion. There's two versions of inflation. There is inflation as far as inflating the cost, meaning uh, the supply chain. The other one is too much money going for too few goods. Well, uh, right now we don't have enough money, nor do we have enough goods. So, we, so it's kind of both. But uh, those who are in charge of the grocery monopoly um, feel that they can. Uh, jack up prices on everything, uh, goods and services, and get away with it. And so far, they've been proven right. And Peter Schiff kind of proves uh, the point that you should never listen to someone like him in regards to uh, anything economically. Uh, because uh, as I pointed out yesterday, I think it was, um, he had to uh, shut down his business and become someone else's uh, employee. Um, and Jimmy Dore, uh, gave him, as I said, about 50 some minutes to pretty much say nothing, uh, because, uh, he was again, talking about, he, he, he wasn't laying the blame, uh, where it squarely should be. And that is the fact that our manufacturing in this country has gone down significantly, uh, in comparison to what we buy overseas or from overseas. Uh, that's the reason why we have a trade deficit is because we buy more than we make here uh, or buy, we uh, don't make as much as we should be uh, uh, sending out to the world, uh, except for our gas. We send plenty of that out. Uh, and given the fact that the Donald Trump tweet from a couple of days ago that I shared multiple times, both on an episode yesterday and not yesterday, I'm sorry, the day before, um, and other platforms I'm sharing on, uh, bragging about, you know, uh, getting a hold of the prince in uh, Saudi Arabia, who then talked to Putin and they stopped supplying uh, about 10 million barrels of uh, petroleum which drove the prices up uh, for Biden. But anyway, and Biden's not exactly helping his case either by not uh, lifting excise taxes, which excise taxes, if you don't know, is a tax of which uh, corporate and uh, gas and oil corporations have to pay in order to bring it into the country. Uh, same thing, with, uh, same thing with, uh, with the states. Anyway, so my point being here is because of all that BS, uh, I just I, it made my resolve of trying to figure out how many MMTers uh, saw the uh, financial crisis before the pe- people like Peter Schiff did. Uh, people, Peter Schiff looked at only the housing market. He didn't look at anything else. Uh, he he only he didn't look at the uh, the corporate uh, debt that were that was being monetized in order to be able to buy up or not buy up excuse me uh sell these uh subprime loans that had no insurance whatsoever i mean not uh fdic insured uh insure uh home insurance that sort of thing anyway uh so let's see uh, well, where maybe i should start here this is, as you can see, the Levy Institute. This is L. Randall Ray. Uh, this is all his stuff. Uh, he's been. He was talking about this. And he was talking about the a recession possibly since uh, uh, Clinton was in office in the nineties, as you can see here. During the recent robust expansion, only seven hundred thousand of the almost twelve million jobs created went to the half of the population that does not have at least some college education, even though. The number of officially unemployed fell to less than 4 million in the, in the 25 and over age group. They, they remain in that group over 26 million 
potentially employable workers, the combined number of those who are actively seeking work and are counted as officially unemployed, and those who are currently out of the labor force but would be willing to participate. Since expansion has not proven sufficient to remedy this uh, intolerably high level of wasted human resources, well-targeted active labor market policies are required. One such policy is a job opportunity. So he was talking about a job program back in 98. That's a transitional job, as you can see. So for people out there who want to say that the uh, the job guarantee was a... Now, I, I said that I thought that Warren Moser actually brought it up. I was wrong. He, he, uh, he's just one of the uh, latest to actually uh, sponsor it. Uh, L. Randall Ray, from what it looks like here, actually came up with the idea for a just transitional job uh, program. Uh, job guarantee, really. Uh, anyway, so let's see. Uh, uh, the uh, labor force are, are willing to uh, participate in SIN's expansion has not, okay, I've already read that, excuse me, <laughs> uh, not proven sufficient to me remedy its intolerable, intolerably high uh, level of wasted human resources, well-targeted, act, uh, active labor market policies are required. One such policy is a job opportunity program that hires off the bottom, uh, providing minimum wage jobs for all those who are, uh, uh, who are ready willing and able to work. The program would create a buffer stock of labor from which employers could hire during upturns instead of bidding of the wages of the already employed, and thus would offer more, uh, would both uh, offer both uh, full employment and price stability. Okay, so let's see uh, another piece of stuff he has. Let's see, that was that part. Let's kind of go with, um, let's see, uh, a little bit, the surplus mania. Let's see what this is about. The federal government surplus has finally been achieved and has been met with pronouncement that it is a great gift for the future and with arguments about whether to do uh, what to do with it. However, the surplus will be short-lived if, uh, it, I'm sorry, will be short-lived. It will depress economy, economic growth, and in any case, surpluses cannot be used for anything. And actually, he has a downloadable thing right here if you want to look at that. These are basically, these are basically notes of his, but I think the all pretty much, um, uh, let's see, can Social Security be saved? Let's see. The first part of this paper is an overview of projections of Social Security's future and explain, uh, explanation of why the projections have led many to believe there is a looming financial crisis. We argue that any problem to be faced uh, are far down the road and not severe enough to justify the use of the word crisis. Something will have to be done to resolve the, the real and financial problems that are likely to crop up in two or three decades. However, this does not in itself mean that something has to be done today specifically to save Social Security. The second part of the paper discusses the real and financial nature of Social Security's problem. Almost all commentators have focused on the financial financing of Social Security and thus have proposed financial solutions. We argue that the questions about the future of Social Security concern the size and distribution of the real economic pie. Once this is recognized, it becomes obvious that none of the pop popular reforms, such as privatization, a reduction of current benefits, and President Clinton's proposal to set aside budget surpluses can really help. We conclude with alternative policy recommendations that are consistent with the true nature of the future problem. And the future promise from what, from what I saw was the fact that they put down that it can only be paid with uh, with uh, social security tax. Yeah, not at all how, uh, how they should have put it. Let's see, oh, this is another part, the social security saving. And this is from 1999, I'm not sure, do I, I'm not sure anyway. 
Now, the projections of impending prices in financing for Social Security depends on uh, unduly pessimistic assumptions about basic demographic and economic variables. Moreover, even if the assumptions are accepted, the projected gap between Social Security revenues and expenditures would not constitute a crisis that could be eliminated with a relative simple adjustment when it occurs. The real issue regarding uh, our ability to provide for retirees throughout, um, yeah, throughout the coming century is not the size of Social Security Trust Fund, but the size and distribution of the whole economic pie. And the issue of viewing in, the, in this light, it becomes clear that most proposals to save so the system when looking away budget surpluses investing in the trust fund into the stock market, privatization reduction benefits do not address the real problem of caring for future retirees. Solution consists with the true nature of scope of the problem lying not within the social security system itself, but in, re, in the real, oh, sorry, in realm of general fiscal policy aimed at ensuring the growth of the economy. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Let's go with, yeah, let's go with this one. Okay, so Hyman P. Uh, Minsky insights into the relationship between profits, economic growth, and the public and private financial balances are particularly relevant to today's conditions. How can a Minskyan view be applied in, to, to explain the process that brought the economy to its uh, current state and recommend a policy stance for the future? That's not what I was looking for, but anyway. <laughs> Let's see. Da, 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 da. Why does the Fed want uh, slow growth? Let's see what this is. The Fed has raised interest rates six times in the past year to slow the economy and the belief that unemployment is too low. There is, there is scant evidence, however, that low unemployment leads to uh, inflation, but uh, sorry, inflation that the economy is in danger of overheating or that higher interest rates will reduce inflation. Instead, the Fed is merely uh, hastening a downturn that will impose huge costs on society, society's most disadvantaged. Yeah. Let's see. Um, da, 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 da. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Try to get to that one word. Da, 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 da. No, 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 no. Have a manufacturing crisis. Oh, let's go with this. This is in, in 2006. Wait, 2006? Yeah, 2006, I think. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. So neocon attack on Social Security. I, these, they have been attacking Social Security for the better part of fucking 40 years. Holy shit. Uh, for seven decades, okay, uh, the far right has never uh, veered from its own avowed mission to gut America's most comprehensive, successful, and popular safety net Social Security. While it had won a few small battles, most notably the Greenspan Commission's huge 1983 payroll tax hikes, and the two in the two year increase in the normal retirement age, his efforts never gained a uh, much political traction uh, before 2000. Ironically, the Clinton administration provided some much needed support to the conservative think tanks preposterous claim that Social Security faces financial uh, Armageddon and, can a and candidate Al Gore's only significant campaign issue involved maintaining lock boxes to protect the trust fund by dictating a or that sorry dictating dedicating there we go a portion of projected 15-year budget surpluses to the program i mean if you like this episode cool i appreciate it if you want to subscribe, cool. I appreciate it. Uh, as always, please just check out realprogressives.org. Uh, you get a lot more of a MMT and other, pretty much everything else that uh, I don't do on this show in regards to MMT and, edu and other educational things uh, since I'm an independent person in regards to my own show. So 
I'm just letting you guys know, uh, see monetary policy strategies of the European Bank and Federal Reserve Bank. Oh, let's see what this is 2005. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, I'll check this out one up. Now, it's interesting because earlier, for hell back, I swore I saw that the UK was its own sovereign currency. Um, or, yeah. It, but <clears throat> the odd thing about it was. I looked and it didn't seem like they were on the list anymore. Japan, uh, US, and a few other Canada, and a few others, but I didn't see UK, which is kind of odd. I mean, obviously the author of that could be, you know, could have mistakenly cut them off, but who knows? Let's see. So this was from 2000. Okay. In, okay. So it looks like 2005. Uh, monetary policy strategies of the European Central Bank of Federal Reserve Bank of US. In the debate on monetary policy strategies on both sides of the Atlantic, it is now almost a commonplace to con contrast the Fed and, U and USB e ECB by pointing out that the former's flexibility and capacity to adjust uh, rigidly and the latter's extreme caution and his obsession with low inflation. And in looking at the foundation of the two banks, uh, strategies however we do not find differences that can provide a simple explanation for their di divergent behavior nor for a very different economic performance in the united states and in euroland in our recent years not surprisingly both central banks share the same conviction that money is neutral in a long period and even their short-term policies are based on similar fundamental pr principles the two policy approaches uh, really didn't uh, really differ only in terms of implementation, timing, complacent uh, competence, excuse me, et cetera, but not in terms of the underlying the uh, theoretical orientation. Uh, we then draw the conclusion that monetary policy cannot represent a significant variable in the explanation of the different economic performances of Euroland and the U.S. The two economic areas differences must be explained by considering other factors among which the most important is fiscal policy. Okay. Okay, so let's see. Balance of trade, not payments, is true measure of deficit effects. Let's see. Da, 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 da. No, uh, no, no. Two deficits and state sustainability. Oops. I'm trying to get to something here. Okay, so if a nice one, no, 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 maybe it's the, uh, seven, seven. I mean, it was before, so let's see. Lessons from the Supreme Meltdown. The, this paper uses Hyman P. Minsky's approach to an, analyze the current international financial uh, uh, crisis, which was initiated by problems in the American real estate uh, market. In a 1987 manuscript, Min, uh, manuscript, Minsky had already recognized the importance of the trend towards uh, securitizing of home mortgages. The paper identifies the causes and consequences of the financial uh, innovation that innovations that created the real estate boom and bust. It examines uh, the role played in, by each of the key players, including brokers, appraisers, borrowers, uh, securitizers, securitizers okay, uh, insurers, and regulators. Uh, and creating the crisis, finally, it proposes so, uh, short-run solutions to the current crisis, as well as a longer-run policy to prevent it, a debt deflation from happening again. Now, again, this is December 2007. Now, as far as I know about, that could be from, that could be from a different... Oh, okay, so, okay, so 87. Maybe he's referring to, like, the housing crisis that may have happened then. 
but also kind of tells you that's what happened in 2008, which was like a year later. So maybe this is his way of predicting it. I mean, it seems like it, but who knows? Let's see. Financial markets meltdown. Let's see. And this new public policy brief, uh, senior scholar L. Randall Ray explains today's complex and fragile financial system and how the seeds of crisis were sown by lax oversight, deregulation, and risk innovation, uh, such as secured, securitization. He estimates that the combined losses throughout the entire financial sector could amount to several trillion dollars and that the United States will feel the effects of the crisis for some time, perhaps a decade or more. Ray recommends enhanced oversight of financial institutions, such, uh, sorry, much uh, larger stimulus packages and creation of a new institution in line with uh, President uh, FDR, Homeowners Loan Corporation. Again, this is 2008, April. Let's see. And if memory serves me, around this time, I can't remember how many people were actually saying the same thing that Al Randall Ray was saying or uh, Steve Keen or other people like that. Hmm. Let's see. Let's kind of keep going. What's a central bank to do? I don't know. Commodity market bubble, again, that's in 2008. Ooh, let's see. Uh, you know what? Let's go with this one instead. I'll go back a little bit. Okay, so let's see. While serving as chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, Alan Greenspan, who, by the way, was actually on record saying that, uh, we could print as much money as you want to, just depending on who would accept it, pretty much accept that as payment. Uh, otherwise, we can't go broke uh, in regards to that. Anyway, uh, let's see. And I'm paraphrasing, of course. You can look that up on YouTube. Uh, anyway, uh, advocated uh, unsupervised securitization, subprime lending, uh, option arms, cre credit default swaps, and all manner of financial uh, alchemy in the belief that markets work to reduce and spread risk and to allocate it uh, to those best able to act, uh, to assess and bear it. In his view, markets would stabilize uh, in the absence of nasty government intervention. But as Greenspan now admits, he could never have imagined the outcome, a financial and economic crisis of biblical proportions. <sighs> Uh, the problem is market uh, forces are not stabilizing. Left their own devices, Wall Street wizards gleefully ran right off the cliff and took the rest of us with them for good reason. For, for them, I mean, <laughs> the rest of us with them for good measure. The natural instability of market processes were recognized long ago by John Maynard Keynes and convincingly updated by Hyman P. Minsky. Uh, throughout his career, Minsky's theory explained the transformation of the economic over the post-war period from robust to fragile. He pointed his finger at managed money, huge pools of pension funds, hedge funds, sovereign wealth funds, university, university endowments, money market funds that are outside traditional banking and therefore largely underregulated and undersupervised with large appetites, appetite, appetites for risk management money sought high returns promised by Wall Street's financial engineers who innovated high complex instruments and that few people understood. In this new policy note, President uh, Dimitri P. Pavidmi, okay, oh, sorry, can't pronounce the last name, uh, and research scholar L. Randall Ray take a look back at Wall Street's path to Armageddon. 
and proposed some alternatives to the Bush Paulson plan to bail out to bail both the, uh, the street and American home water. Under the existing plan, Treasury could become an owner of troubled financial institutions in exchange for a capital injection, but without exercising any ownership rights, such as replacing the management that created the mess, the bailout, and that would be used as an opportunity to consider control of the nation, nations, nations, and nations financial system in the hands of a few large Wall Street banks with government funds subsidizing purchases of troubled Ber Berks, Jesus, banks by healthy ones. But it is highly unlikely that relieving banks of some of their bad ha assets or injecting some equity into them will increase their willingness to lend. Resolving the liquidity crisis is the best strategy, the authors say, and keeping small to medium-sized banks open is the best way to ensure access to credit once the economy recovers. A temporary sus suspension of the collection of payroll taxes would put more income into the hands of the households while lowering the employment costs for firms, fueling spending and employment. The government should assume a more active role in helping homeowners sell with mortgage debt they cannot afford, providing low-cost 30-year loans directly to all corners. In the meantime, a moratorium on foreclosures is necessary and federal grants to support local spending on needed projects would go a long way towards rectifying or, uh, sorry, our $1.6 trillion public infrastructure deficit. Can the Treasury afford all these measures? The answer, the author says, uh, yes. And is, uh, and is a bargain if one considers the cost of not doing it. It is obvious that, the, that there exist unused uh, resources today as unemployment rises and factories are idled due to a lack of demand. Markets are also voting with, other for, with their dollars for more Treasury debt. This does not mean the Treasury should spend without restraint. Whatever rescue plan is adopted should be well planned and targeted and of the proper size. The point is that setting arbitrary budget constraints is neither necessary nor desired, especially in the worst financial and economic crisis since the Great Depression. Now, again, this was in 08. And I have already read you at least a couple things that L. Randall Ray and other uh, uh, authors along with him have said since 05, 06 and above, uh, even going back to the Clinton administration. So people of the MMT uh, way of thinking have been on top of it for quite a while. So people like uh, Peter Schiff, can you know go somewhere else with their opinion because they only look at one side of the economy and not at the overall the whole side of the uh, the economy that's where mmt uh actually are mmt uh, enthusiasts mmt acknowledge you know knowledgeable uh, so, uh something i'm trying to be every day um look at not just uh supply chain credits uh monetary uh what's the fi uh, fiscal flow stuff of that nature that's why people like mike norman is really good to listen to and the people he listens to you know that sort of thing um and also warren mosler and again El rondo ray uh bill mitchell of australia um i think it's from australia I, have, I may have the wrong as far as the part goes now. Anyway, uh, Stephanie Johnson, of course, you know, people like that. So anyways, um, that's pretty much what I got for the day. I just wanted to kind of go and I saw this and I was like, you know, maybe I should look more into this. Uh, and Eric, let me see. Uh, uh, trying to figure out something here. Sorry, guys. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Nope. Nope. Okay. So, okay. So this might be what I'm looking for. 
Now this is by uh, Steve. Uh, I think this is by Steve Machine. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, you gotta double check here. Okay, no, Dirk uh, Bezimer. I believe he goes through who uh, actually knew about it. Uh, let's see, damn. Uh, I was trying to. <laughs> Let's see, he does point out that Godly uh, saw this coming. Uh, what's that? Oh, Godly and a few other people. Um, shoot. Yeah, okay, references here. So let's see, we have uh, Godly, we have uh, uh, Michael Hudson. We also have Steve Keen, we have uh, Werner, we have Richardson. Uh, yeah, people like that uh, have all been talking about this. Let's see, Graziani, which I'm not sure if he is the MMT or, but either way, uh, this I believe this uh, this points out that anybody who is serious about uh, the financial uh, sector's flows uh, explains it, so... It's not, I mean, my point being is the fact that the mainstream economists don't know what the f they're talking about. But anyway, uh, there we go. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening, whatever, ha whatever have you. Um, yeah, just if you see this, go to this page. You can learn more about MMT that way. And uh, if you're in Ohio, First of all, thanks for watching. Second of all, uh, go to the uh, go to the Columbus Main Library and you'll find these yourselves. Uh, I'll in the back, right by where you would pick up uh, materials that were put on hold for you. Anyways, uh, thanks for watching. Peace out for now, and yeah, just learn MMT. That's the most important thing you can actually kind of do right now as an adult. Peace out for now.